servers, um, both from my company and my own host, uh, my own servers that are hosted either independently or on the Amazon cloud. And it was actually relatively seamless. Um, this is something I've been I've been working on for a while, uh, ditching my laptop. And um, there have it's not been without problems. So I'm hoping I can, if anybody else is interested, share share a couple of tips and save you some of the problems that I had. Uh, the first one, I, I even banged together a presentation on Google Docs, but um, the, the, the first note is that when you're working from a cell phone, you're always going to want a big computer for something. And generally, these things are really easy to have as long as you have an internet connection. If you want to burn DVDs, hmm, not going to work. But Basically, everything you could need, you could get out of an Amazon EC2 instance, you could get out of a Linode, you can get it out of a machine that's sitting in your apartment. Um, the key is to have resources to connect to them. Most of the time with a, with a Linux or Unix box on the other end, this is just a SSH, if you're doing local development on your phone, it might be a little bit more complicated. I'll go into that. Um, now. We have, beyond connectivity, the other issue is, where do you put the files? Do you keep them locally with you, in your pocket? Do you keep them in the cloud? You can use both options. It depends on how many resources with Dropbox and Git and similar services that you need to call in. Um, now, oh, 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 where'd it go? Oh, I'm flying on my own. Uh, if you're programming on a remote host, you can often just sync the, the code development directory using, using Git to your phone or your local device, and it travels with you. When you get an internet connection, you sync it back. Easy peasy. Um, when, you don't, when you do have an internet connection that you can rely on, this is a great thing, um, you can pretty much just act like you have a machine there. And this is where you get a few more issues that I found during the, the week that I was in Nepal. One of which is Android key mappings seem to change when you install software updates. Now this happened for me. <laughs> and suddenly all of my function keys stopped working. I was using function keys on one of these. There is a great little tool that you can use. Um, there are actually a number of great tools you can use to figure out what keystrokes you're sending from an external keyboard which you'd be using if you're working in the cloud, um, to your Android device. Ask me if you're curious. Uh, external Keyboard Helper Pro is one of them. Um, but otherwise, I don't have a presentation. Um, otherwise, it's, it can be fairly frustrating to get your, ex your command characters in there. Um, programs like Terminal IDE, have an have a Android keyboard that will handle these very well. I suggest it highly, and I think it's free. Um, this one is Bluetooth. Um, so a combination of a Bluetooth keyboard, Bluetooth mouse, and terminal IDE is just like having a full-size computer. Um, now, the other thing is, if you're connecting to a Linux host or a Windows host. With Linux, you're mostly command line anyway, so you're good. With Windows, you need a VNC tool, and something that really helps is to set up shares, because that way you can connect to them using Samba clients. And this makes your life so much easier um, when you can access the files on the Windows host without actually having to go on to the Windows host. Uh, the other... Uh, Oh, it's like I don't have a presentation here at all. Um, for things like programming, it's great to use tools like um, Git, GitHub, Tmux, Screen. Uh, Tmux and Screen allow you to act like you have multiple windows on a very small screen, such as your Android device. Uh, and it it's the way to make a small screen seem like eight small screens, um, or 16, or however many you want. And
Well, of course I have. <laughs> Actually, I don't think a root is necessary for any of any of the things I've just mentioned. So that's fairly basic. It if you're connecting to certain VPNs that require different kernel modules, root will be required. Um, but it's generally fairly straightforward to act like you have a full-size computer from your phone. <laughs> It's a Samsung. I'm a I'm a trend trendster. Any any more questions? Okay. Uh, thank you. And next up Euclidean fact or fiction? This is going to be just a video. Um, so if anybody wants to jump ahead of me for their lightning talk, this is not very important. Uh, it's just sort of like a bit of um, news that you might be interested in. Maybe it's not so technical and not so important if anybody has something that they want to spend a bit more time on. Otherwise, I'll just play it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So Euclidion is a is a company uh, in Brisbane, small Australian company, and um, people have been thinking that their technology is either really amazing or an amazing scam job. So I'll play this video. They got a two million dollar grant from the federal government. So uh, they've been on um, news shows and things. Oh, I've not got sound. Yeah. Where's the speaker? No, you can keep that on. How do you make it go? We had found a way to give computer graphics unlimited power. Basically, computer graphics today are made of these little flat shapes called polygons, and a lot of big companies spend a lot of money. Go on silent. Oh, 
not making any sound. Good phones up here. <clears throat> Good old VLC. I'm Bruce Robert Dell, the CEO of Euclidia. In 2010, our technology appeared in most of the world's media. We had found a way to give computer graphics unlimited power. Basically, computer graphics today are made of these little flat shapes called polygons, and a lot of big companies spend a lot of money trying to have more of these little flat shapes so your graphics will look better. In 2010, our technology appeared in most of the world's media. We had found a way to give computer graphics unlimited power. Basically, computer graphics today are made of these little flat shapes called polygons, and a lot of big companies spend a lot of money trying to have more of these little flat shapes so your graphics will look better and everything won't be quite so angular. There is a better way to do computer graphics, which is used in medicine and the sciences, and that is to make everything out of tiny little atoms instead of flat panels. The problem is, this particular system uses up a lot of processing power, so the more objects you have on the screen, the slower your computer will run. Having four or five detailed objects will run just fine, but you certainly can't do a level of a game. We got a lot of attention because we made the claim that we could run unlimited little 3D atoms in real time. To understand this claim, you need to consider the state of the industry. There's lots of large companies that are pouring billions of dollars into trying to increase the polygon count. At present, they seem to be able to increase it by about 25% a year. If any of these large companies was to suddenly come out with 10 times more polygons than their competitors, Sorry, um... that would be enormous news. But we didn't increase the geometry count by 10 times, or 100 times, or 1,000 times, we increased it so far we could abandon polygons altogether and move to little atoms and run them in unlimited quantities. If what we said was true, then it was the largest breakthrough since 3D graphics began. Two months after announcing it, we declined all further interviews and then completely disappeared. Most people said the technology was too unbelievable and was probably... I'll just switch the... Um... I'll just switch the video onto one screen, see if that helps. Never real to begin with. It's been one year since our disappearance, and a lot of people are asking what's happened to us. Well, we're not finished yet, but we'll give you an update as to our present level of advancement. We've made a little island. The island is one kilometer square. This island is made of 21 trillion, 62 billion, 352 million, 435,000 polygons. In the graphics industry, everyone's used to using polygons, so we thought we'd build a polygon converter. By converting polygons to unlimited detail point cloud data, you can then run them in unlimited quantities. We've converted them at a rate of 64 atoms per cubic millimeter. If you're not sure how small a cubic millimeter is, that's a rate of 1 million atoms per cubic inch. If you're still not sure how small that is, these are grains of dirt. In fact, there are 15 million converted polygons in every square meter of dirt, which means in one cubic meter of dirt, we have more polygons than you will find in any game that doesn't use procedural generation. Graphics are definitely getting a lot better. If you compare Crisis 1 to Crisis 2, you see nearly double the polygon count, but things still don't look realistic. That's not the fault of the artist. In fact, we're eager to see what happens when we give our technology to real artists in the games industry. We played with it ourselves, of course, and we came up with this. But remember, we're far from the world's best artists. So it would be very interesting to see where our technology ends up going when there's more synchronization with other players in the industry. Our polygon converter converts things straight from 3ds Max, Maya, and other 3D programs, so it's pretty much business as usual for the artist. He just has total freedom now, and there is no such thing as a polygon budget. Polygon counts are pretty low today in games. If we look at things like palm trees, and they compare them to, say, a palm tree made with unlimited detail in our technology, we can see that the polygon budget was pretty restrictive. So by removing that burden from artists' lives, I'm sure we'll make a few friends. As for our supporters who play games, your graphics are about to get better. Better by a factor of about 
100,000 times. 100,000 is a pretty big number. Perhaps we're exaggerating, so we'll let you be the judge of that. The grounding games today consists of a very nice photo on the ground and some blades of grass sticking up from it. This is our ground in unlimited detail, and obviously even the grains of dirt, as mentioned before, are real geometry. So if you look around, the leaves, the twigs, the blades of grass, all those little groundy type things are now all real. Your game environments will also be real. When I say real, I mean made of little atoms, just like our real world. Your game environments up until now have been a bunch of tricks to deal with the low polygon budget. Things like sprites which are always facing you, or objects in the distance which are just really flat pieces of cardboard. Or things like a cactus, where it's very, very detailed on one side, but um, we don't want to waste polygons, so the other side looks like an octopus tentacle. Sometimes objects far away just disappear into the fog, and other times they just pop up as they swap between different models. I'm sure in the future our children will look back with amusement on these things, in the same way that we look back on blocky three-color graphics. Getting back to our island demo, I hope you will forgive the repetitious graphics. Please remember we're a technology company, we're not a games company. To have a look at a few individual items, if we look here at this rock, I hope you will permit me to say it looks rather real. That's because it is. It's actually been scanned in from the real world. Scanning technology that brings things in from the real world has existed for quite some time. The problem was what it produced was so high in geometry, you could never use it in games. In the future, graphics will be divided into two categories, fiction and non-fiction. What we mean is, if I want to make Super Mario or a dragon or a unicorn, I can't go out into the forest, tranquilize them and laser scan them. They're not there. So I need an artist to do that. So the artwork that doesn't exist we call fiction. That means it's made by an artist. This tree is fiction. It's been made by an artist. It's not laser scanned in. The rock, on the other hand, is non-fiction. And the cactus is a hybrid of the two. To make this cactus, we didn't have any cactuses that looked this way in our little part of Australia. The cactuses that we had weren't quite as interesting. So we took the pieces of them, we twirled them around to make circles, and then we added some dry leaves on top, which we changed the color of. If we were a little bit more creative, we would have taken the wings of a swan and put them on a tiger, but we didn't think of that at the time. This island demonstration shows our present level of technology, but that level is far from complete. For example, at present, our island has only two shades of shadows. Just after we made this demonstration, we progressed to having multiple shades of shadow. So in our next demonstration, you're going to find the lighting is going to look a lot better. We're also running at 20 frames a second in software, but we have versions that are running much faster than that, which aren't quite complete yet. Some months from now, our software development kit will be complete, and it will be ready to be handed over to the game's developers. Until then, we're all working as hard as we can, and we hope to produce a product that our fans and supporters will find acceptable. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this presentation. So sorry about the um, video breakups there. I, I don't know what, it might be something to do with the resolution, I don't know. Um, it worked fine before uh, we came. And so that's um, Bruce Dell narrating there. He's the CEO of Euclidion, a Brisbane company, um, which may or may not be fraudulent. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, sorry? Yeah, well, a lot of people like, I think uh, I read that um, the guy who, in, who made Minecraft came out and said, um, this is definitely not real. He works with voxels, and, and uh, it's not possible. Um, and uh, John Carmack, who created the Doom franchise, originally said that he didn't think it was possible and thought it was a scam. But he's since came out and said that, yeah, he thinks it might be possible. But um, because it's closed source software and everything, and you know, company secret, um, they can't have uh, public scrutiny of any kind. Um, and they're, they're not really releasing much information about it, and they're not developing it really fast because they're a small company. Um, so, yeah, the it's... The other problem is, the more adamant you say, you say it. Yes. So as your tone and pitch gets higher and higher, you become more adamant, you start to say more and more. 
Well, he, he also, uh, I've got another video here where he's putting on a British accent for, uh, for his geospatial video. Um, he's, uh, Euclidion's um, created a software uh, for a geospatial industry, um, which is like some kind of, um, uh, you know, like Google, Google Maps type stuff where they have maps of, of uh, real, real world stuff. Uh, which they do in voxels. And um, so I've got another video. Maybe I'll show it next time. Um, and um, yeah, but he's doing a British accent. He's obviously got sort of good drama skills and stuff. He could easily be a con man, from my opinion. But um, mm. Yeah, well, he did say in there, uh, the reason why the, the, the technical demo that was in, showed in that video is um, all repeated terrain and stuff is because they're a small company and they don't, well, you know, what he said was they, they don't have the resources to put together a proper uh, demonstration of, of what their technology can do uh, and that... Um, They didn't show any moving, um, moving stuff. No, that the shadows weren't very detailed. These are the criticisms that, that people have online. There's a lot of debate if you go online uh, about uh, about it, and uh, yeah. Yeah, well, what um, I think he, he t went over that in this video, it was sort of went through it very quickly. I've got another couple of videos, but um, the way it's supposed to work is um, they only draw uh, information for each pixel on the screen. And so the computer's only processing what needs to be shown on the screen. And what they've done is, is apparently they've created an algorithm which searches for the information that needs to be displayed on the screen and only assigns the computer to process that information. And yes. Yeah, well, they, um, he, he says often in his videos that uh, Bruce Delbert, the CEO, he makes the videos for some reason. Uh, he's, he's a good presenter, I suppose. Um, he says that they've been working in software mostly, and they don't actually have any hardware acceleration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it'll be amazing. I mean, I, I, I heard that, I, I saw a video which was demonstrating um, their Geoverse um, software, which is for the geospatial industry. They, this video was um, it released in 2010, and they were focusing on games. Then they got approached by um, people from, from the geospatial industry who wanted to use it for geospatial stuff. And um, so they, they shifted their focus onto that. To see, to, sorry? Yeah, yeah, so I guess they've got to be very secretive about it. Like it's all in somebody's head. Yeah, it might be. <coughs> sorry. Okay, um, thank you. Very good. <laughs> next talk, uh, next slide, no Chromebook stuffs. And we don't have <laughs> we don't have a name. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Going to have to watch that to make sure that it's.
five minutes or something. Oh, okay. You can make it. I'll try and make it quick. Okay. Sorry, Hello, everyone. Um, whoopsie. Things are falling over here. So if we can. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, I'm going to give a quick demonstration of um, of something I found that was cool on on this Chromebook I've borrowed from Patrick um, over the past month. Um, so it's just a bog standard Chromebook. What I de what I demonstrate probably will just work in Chrome on a PC as well. Um, let me just log into this thing. Um, Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, so I'm not going to not going to dwell on the standard bits of a Chromebook. If you don't know what a Chromebook is, it's basically a laptop that runs a web browser, and that's it. Um, so the first thought is, well, how useful is that? How useful? How you, how how much work can you actually get done if all you had was a web browser? Well, surprisingly, you can do a lot. Um, now there's the standard there's the standard web apps here. You've got your you've you've got your Google apps and that sort of thing. Um, um, I had my laptop die on me um, a couple of weeks ago, and as an experiment, I thought I'd try the Chromebook for a couple of days. And what I discovered was there's this company called Rollapp. If I can just, just bring it up, actually. And <coughs> These guys get standard desktop applications, and they run them. They run them on a server, and then you access them as a thin client on your on your computer. So, if you, as long as you've got a, a decent enough internet connection, you can access some um, pretty full featured software. And we're talking um, software packages that we that we all know and love. Um, things like LibreOffice and Inkscape and GIMP and so on. Um, so, if I was to give an example. So you install them into the Chrome OS, just like any other Chrome app, and then they just show up in your menu, um, like so. So uh, let's just say I want to open a LibreOffice Writer document. Um, I'm not even sure if I'm on the network here. Let me just double check that. Yes, I am. OK. So it's telling me I have a high latency connection. So I don't know how well this is going to work, but let's let's just see. Um, there's a little bar at the top that says how good my connection is. Apparently, it's quite poor, but that's LibreOffice Writer right there. Now, then the question is, okay, what about my files? Do I do I are they stored on the computer or are they stored in the cloud? Well, they can be stored in the cloud. So if I go let's open open, I've got this attached to my Dropbox and Google Drive accounts. So if I go into Dropbox, for example, um, these are my Dropbox folders. Oops, it's the wrong folder. Um, it's a bit slow because, well, imagine you're doing VNC or NX or some such. It's essentially the same thing, which means that you're not going to get full quality graphics either, but it's perfectly usable as far as I can tell. Um, so that's just the document I've been working on lately. Happens to be my CV, um, so you know you got you got all the standard um, got all the standard features of LibreOffice because that actually is LibreOffice, um, and likewise, let's see if I wanted to open uh, Inkscape. I think I've got Inkscape here. Any day now. This is the drawback. You need a decent internet connection. I have not tried on a 3G connection or anything like that, so I don't know how mobile you can truly be in a real world scenario. Um, I've just been testing on um, my home Wi Fi. Um, <clears throat> but I could just go, let's see, open. Is it, what's it been like on Wi Fi at home? Well, I haven't. Uh, I haven't done a huge amount of real work. It seemed it seemed good enough, um, but I, I I can't truthfully say I've tried it hard enough to to recommend it. But I just thought this is cool, and the fact that you can buy a Chromebook for you know two hundred bucks, and 
be anywhere you want and still access your files and be able to edit them wherever you want. Pardon? They claim they claim to be able to run anything, which I believe also includes Windows apps. But I haven't seen those apps. The only apps I've actually seen available on this site are Linux apps. Um, so they they seem to be a pretty new service. So that's that's Inkscape there. Um, if it's going to respond, I should be able to like select bits and pieces. Just to, there you go. So it's actually real. Um, yeah, they. Uh, they seem to be in beta mode at the moment. I don't know when they're going to become real. I don't know if it's going to stay free. Um, all I know is that it's worked for what I wanted to do, and it might be worth, if, if anyone's interested, just having a play with it. That's basically it. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, apparently you can install a full Linux distro on them, and yeah, it becomes you, a netbook. You, you can actually just do it, run it in the background and create the environment, then run a VNC client in your Chrome browser, and uh, X11 VNC, and run your apps actually on the device itself, locally. But I'd imagine you've done this before, that's why I was wondering if any of you have tried it. No, can't say I have. But if you install the standard Linux distro on it, it's just going to be like a netbook. So yeah. if that's if that's the kind of experience you want, then you're better off instead of using VNC, just running a full OS on it. <laughs> okay, thank you to the to our lightning talk speakers. And uh, we seem not to have got anyone for our ID too, so uh, sorry about that. Maybe next time there'll be someone. And uh, right now we have a short break where we finish up all the food and set up for the main talk, and we'll be back in about five or ten minutes. Um, please eat the food. Thank you. 
Kim, are you getting anything? HDMI cable into HDMI plug. Yep. And it's saying that it's got a 29 inch something. Panasonic industry company, 29 inches. Yep, and what resolution are you sending? 1024 by 768. What? Um, That's what it's offering me. Uh, I'll try something else and that didn't work, so now I'm waiting for it to come back. What I do. How about I use VGA? Yes, VGA is preferred if you can use VGA. I was assuming that... Okay. VGA's old technology, so it works for stuff in the Yeah, but had a good 30 years to plug it. Whereas HDMI still has, you know, another 20 years before. I think it's 
This food almost finished. Mm. I think we better. I think I better start with my talk now. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so my name's my name's Yuri and this talk is um <coughs> pardon me. This talk is uh, universal computation in the first eight decades. And the um, basic question in this talk is um, sort of what is computation? And um, this is one of those questions that, um, one of those stories where it's always hard to pin when exactly it started, whether it was some. Um, you know, back in the 17th century, at the beginning of the 20th century. But one fairly specific date is 1928, which is 85 years ago, when um, Hilbert, which is um, who's, uh, one of the more important mathematicians around at the time, uh, clarified some question that he had um, actually posed in 1900. And part of the clarification was the question along the lines of, is something mathematical that doesn't matter right now, is that thing computable? Of course, this was mathematicians. They can't really answer that question until they define what they mean by computable. And within, what is it, seven, eight years, they had not just one definition, they had about four uh, by Alan Turing, Alonzo Church, Emil Post, and Stephen Kleen. And those all came out pretty much at the same time in 1936. I think one of them was published in 1937 in January. And, um, but all around the same time. So the definition Turing had is um, he didn't actually have a gadget like this. He just had mathematics. Um, and his definition was, um, you'd kind of recognize it as a computer. It had a CPU with one register. And instead of random access memory, it had this tape where you could only read the spot that was in front of you, and you could move left or right. And you could write to the spot in front of you, but you couldn't say, move a thousand spots, you actually had to move there one spot at a time. So that's called a Turing machine because it was invented by Turing. He didn't call it a Turing machine, he called it an A machine. And um, Church had a very different definition. It was, um, it's called lambda calculus, partly because they're mathematicians so they use Greek letters. Partly because um, the language was built around anonymous functions. And if you're going to have a programming language, which the main thing in it is an anonymous function, you want a short word for it. So he used the one Greek letter lambda. And um, yeah, anonymous functions was basically all there was in that language. It didn't have variables 
other than function arguments. It didn't have assignment, didn't have numbers. It really, all it had was, um, was anonymous functions. So you have these two definitions which came about in basically the same year. Now the question is, we have a question. Anonymous function. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, when you're writing a program, in most programming languages, you can write functions or procedures. And um, generally, you give them a name, and then you use that name to refer to them. And in most programming languages these days, or at least in many of them, you can define a function without giving it a name. And then you can either call it right away, or you can assign it to a variable. And in Lambda Calculus, they didn't have um, assigning to a variable. So you either had to call it right away, or you had to pass it to another function right away. So that that's how Lambda Calculus worked. And yeah, you didn't, you wouldn't want to spell out the word function every time you, you used one of these, given that that's all you had in the language. Sorry, I should have explained that a bit more. <laughs> I get into the habit of assuming that everyone's a programmer. <laughs> Uh, how many people are programmers here, just out of interest? That's about half, maybe a bit less than half? <laughs> oh, it's a start. <laughs> um, so yeah, they had these two definitions and the other two definitions. Um, one of them was a bit similar to Turing's. ML Post was fairly similar to Turing's. Cleans was um, somewhat similar to Lambda Calculus. And there are these two very different definitions. And the question is, is there a real difference between them? Or are they actually equivalent? Are they the same thing? Now, one question is, how would you tell whether two definitions of computation are equivalent? And um, I'll use more modern languages for that, and this is a bit of the explanation. If you wanted to tell whether Python and Ruby are equivalent, one way to do that is you write an emulator or an interpreter for Python in Ruby. And you know, those of you who know both languages, you could do it. It would be a bit tedious in places, but it wouldn't be any real problem to do that. And then you'd write a Ruby, then you write a Python interpreter in Ruby, and that will tell you um, the other half of the equivalence. Because that means that any program that you can run in Ruby, you can also run in Python by loading up the Ruby interpreter and then the Ruby program. And same, same the other way around. So that's the usual definition of, that's the usual way of actually defining that two programming languages or two definitions of computation are equivalent. You could probably prove it in some other way, but I've never actually heard of anyone proving it in any other way other than going, there's an emulation or interpreter going one way and there's an emulation or interpreter going the other way. And, um, Occasionally, you see like a triangle thing. If you already know that Python and Ruby are equivalent, then you can, and you want to check Perl, then if you find it more convenient, you can like do one direction from Python and the other direction from Ruby. It doesn't make any difference. And um, yeah, there's a couple of caveats on that. One of them is that um, if you run an emulator or an interpreter, it's not going to be very fast. And at least for this definition, it's assumed that nobody cares about how fast it is. The other one is um, you sort of politely assume that you have unlimited memory in your computers, which is a bit like the joke about physicists having, you know, 
perfectly spherical cow in a vacuum. We assume that all our computers have um, more memory than we'll ever need for whatever we're doing with them, at least for this, this particular definition. So Turing machine and lambda calculus. Even back in 1936, they managed to work out that, um, yeah, these two definitions are equivalent. You can write a lambda calculus interpreter to make it work on a Turing machine. And you can write a Turing machine emulator and make it work on lambda calculus. And once you got those two, then they're both equivalent. So at that point, the mathematicians were happy because they had like a reason, what seemed like a reasonable definition of what's computable and what's not. And they could go on to answer that question whether their problem is computable. I think the answer was no, but a um, couple of decades later, um, these devices started to be invented, actual physical computers. And um, once again, apart from the fact that most of these have limited memory, some of them very limited memory, you can run a Turing machine emulation on any of them. You can run a lambda calculus interpreter on any of them. So in a very fundamental way, all those computers, whether it's a laptop or a Brainiac, or whatever it's called, a modern server or a rather older server, they all do the same thing. They don't do it as fast as each other. Some of them have different colors. But ultimately, if you ask them a question, they will all eventually come up with the same answer. And um, once we had these things, we also started making programming languages. And once again, you can write a C interpreter in Python. You can write a Python interpreter in C. In fact, there is a Python interpreter in C. That's what you normally use when you just type Python or when you click on the Python icon. It's written in C. And yeah, writing a C interpreter in Python, it wouldn't be a problem. It'd be tedious in bits. And, um, you know, you'd, you'd probably spend more than one or two rainy weekends if you wanted to actually go do it. But um, there's no fundamental problem with it. All these all these languages can be used to in implement the same same problems, same calculations. There's even weird things that uh, can be used to compute things. Who knows Conway's Game of Life? Only three people. It's one of those games where you set it up at the beginning. And then the rules take over, and you don't touch it again, and you just watch what happens. And um, the rules are pretty simple. If there's a white spot which has three black neighbors, it becomes black next turn. If there's a black spot which has two or three black neighbors, it stays black, otherwise it turns white. And that's it. Then you just watch it. This one would. Um, sort of um, move in this direction down the screen because, um, you know, this one has um, three neighbors, so it goes black. This one has um, too many white neighbors, so it goes white. And um, the whole pattern sort of flips and moves diagonally this way. And you can obviously run write that in something like Python. 
it's fairly common. This is the sort of thing you might do on a rainy weekend. You know, you write it on Saturday and then Sunday it's still raining, so you play with it. <laughs> and in the other direction, you wouldn't want to write a Python interpreter in it because there's not enough rainy weekends. But there has been someone who has um, written an actual Turing machine in it. It's got the bit in, the, in a pattern of black and white squares. It's got the bit that represents the register. And it's got the bit that represents the tape going left and right. And um, these guys and a bunch of other ones like them are running around and transferring information between them, and it works. If you're patient enough, it will calculate things for you. Although you have to be quite a fair bit patient to actually program it to do anything other than other than a demo to show that it works. And Magic the Gathering. People play Magic the Gathering? Yes? No? It's a card game. And somebody recently found that um, if you like have a game with four players and you set up all the cards exactly right, then you can have one turn. Like one player's one turn can do a calculation. And again, this is without any interaction. I think in that particular one there's a card that says May and it only works if you always say yes, I will do that. But it's the cards making the calculation. So, and again, the rules of Magic the Gathering wouldn't be a problem to write in, you know, Python, C, COBOL. Does anybody still program COBOL? Probably. There was news articles in, on the, in the year 1999 saying, can we help COBOL programmers to fix our old, fix our old code? So given that all these very different things um, are equivalent to each other, we sort of go, maybe we should call that universal computation. And you might wonder, is it really universal? Is there something that it might not do? Are there things missing? Are there things that it can't do? And it turns out that it's actually very hard to come up with something that you know you could plausibly call computation and which isn't equivalent to these things. Regular expressions is one of them, but not the way Perl does them. Because Perl kept adding extensions to them until they turned into universal computation. Yep, question? <laughs> yeah, most of the ones that you see, it's um, regular expressions are a, a tool that you can use when you're writing a program when you want to match the kind of thing that's like, I want to have between five and ten letters followed by three digits, or match a phone number. So it's this many digits, then maybe a minus sign, and then some more digits. And Search and replace, yeah. Yeah. And um, if you actually do what the mathematicians call regular expressions rather than what the Perl programmers call regular expressions, then it's not a universal. It can't do all the calculations for you. But it's really handy if you want to do, you know, search and replace on, uh, you know, you've got a You've got a list of names, which is surname, comma, first name. And you can do, OK, I want any number of characters followed by a comma followed by any number of characters. And that's you can write that as a regular expression in about, well, no. <laughs> yeah, too few characters to be legible, really. And um, then it'll pick out, here's the first, here's the last name, here's the first name, and then you can swap them or something. SQL, which is used to access databases, if you ignore the 
if you ignore the procedural bits, I think SQL itself, the actual commands to retrieve and retrieve data from the database and uh, put data in the database isn't universal. And yeah, finite state machine is basically if you take a Turing machine and take the tape away and you're left with just a computer with a CPU and run register and nothing else, that's a finite state machine and it's not a universal computer anymore. So you have a couple of things, but nothing that really convincingly could be called computation. And on the other end of the scale, you can define things that are, yep, question? Uh, yes, uh, Turing complete is a synonym for universal computation. Sorry, I meant to mention that, but um, not following my notes. Huh. Yeah, hypercomputation is, you can define how you might do computation that's more powerful than the universal computation, but none of these are really practical. You can't really have a computer that's infinitely fast. You know, if you write in your program, do step one, two, and three, and then do step four infinitely many times, and then do step five, there's no really way to build that. Well, uh, yeah, that is a problem, but there, there are ways of defining it. Uh, there's a couple of different ways of defining it, and um, depending on which way you define it, um, the easiest one to think of is you can have some steps that do take time, and then you have a step that repeated infinitely many times, and then you have some other steps that take time. Other ways to define that are um, that after that infinitely many steps, whatever was the last answer that it gave is the answer that should hold. If you want strict definitions, you can look them up and there's, there's actually several definitions because people had basically your objection. If, that, if it's infinitely fast, how do you get data in and out of it? <laughs> so yeah, you can get more strict definitions that will, that will take care of that question. And yeah, there's some quantum computers, but not the ones that are in the news. Those ones aren't good enough. Some types of time travel. I have better uses for time travel, frankly, but um, yeah, so what we end up with is um, a big box in the middle with universal computation, which, as you pointed out, is called Turing machine, Turing complete, after, after the Turing machine, and um, some obscure things that are less than universal or more than universal. And it's really interesting when you think about it because one consequence is that there's no such thing as a special purpose computer. Anytime you have a special purpose computer, it's just a universal computer being used for a particular purpose, but it's still universal underneath. Of course, these days, computers are getting into pretty much everything. And they say planes are Solaris boxes with wings on them. Elevators are computers that you step into and you hope that you'll be able to step out again. Pacemakers are computers that you get implanted in your body and right next to your heart. And you hope they keep you healthy. Hearing aids. Telephones. I'm the one on the screen that's an older model which didn't have computers yet, but um, these days, um, a year or two ago, there was like an ad in a magazine which had a computer in it, just so that the ad could update. It had like a computer in it with um, basically a smartphone, 
and um, the app could update based on stuff from the network. That's how cheap computers are getting. TVs these days, mostly computers. <laughs> and they are all universal computers underneath, <laughs> which um, is a bit worrying if you have things, like people saying like, you know, let's regulate special purpose computers that do, you know, planes. But you're not regulating special purpose computers. Such a thing doesn't exist. <laughs> but um, I think that may be a whole different talk for a whole another evening. Um, yeah, any questions? Uh, SQL the language, um, basically there's no way of um, uh, repeating in it. Because um, one way to get a universal language is you need to have a way of making decisions and you need to have a way of repeating. And SQL has plenty of ways of making decisions, but it doesn't have a way of repeating. Like, one way you could make a, an extension to SQL that would make it universal would be if you could um, define a view that refers to a view that you define later. Because then, by referring to itself, that would suddenly get that loop that you need to get universal computation. And you'd have to be careful so that it eventually finishes referring to itself. We have rem <laughs> we have infinite memory, <laughs> but um, it wouldn't really because um, and depending on what you're calculating with it, you just make sure that you finish going in a loop very quickly, and that's pretty easy. Views have conditions on them that tell you what rows to return, so you just make sure that you code those right so that it only loops as many times as you need to get your answer. But um, yeah, I guess the other way to get SQL to be um, universal programming language is, um, I suspect a bunch of them use the Perl regular expressions, <laughs> at which point you ignore SQL and you just write <laughs> regular expression with back references. But <laughs> Well, what you'd have to do to, in order to do that is um, you define the view, and you'd have to make sure that you define all the other views that you're using before you actually try to select from it. So you can do your create view, and when you do the create view, um, you don't actually need to know what's in the other view. You might know, need to know what column names there are, but um, you could you could deal with that if you're making extensions. But um, in normal SQL, there's no way to do that looping around thing. Any other questions? Did that make sense? <laughs> yep. Probably not. This one's really, this one's really a bit old to be. Um, but again, you need to like an easy way to get uh, 
universal computation or Turing completeness is to have some way to make decisions and some way to repeat stuff. And that one, you dial the numbers in and then it just goes through them once. It doesn't make any decisions and doesn't repeat again from the beginning. So no, that wouldn't be. Yeah, question? No, no, that's all right. Uh, how does the, what does the Turing machine actually do? The Turing machine basically, back when it was defined in 1936, um, the main purpose of it was um, to proof papers. But um, the way it works is um, like, let me put that picture up again. No, Turing machine. Um, like in this box, it keeps one number or some other symbol. And it's got this tape. And it can read what's on the symbol, you know, what's on the tape. And depending on the combination of the symbol on the tape and the symbol in the box, it can do one about four or five things. It can move one step left on the tape. It can move one step right. It can replace the symbol on the tape. It can replace what it remembers. And it can stop. And that's it. And once it stops, you sort of read the tape, which will have um, the answer to your calculation. So it would be a really, really uh, annoying computer to program. The the advantage of it is that because it has so many, uh, so few parts, it's it's not so much the most common denominator. It's um, it's easy to do things like, you know, you only have so many things when you're writing a proof in a mathematical paper, or if you're making it in a game of life, where you know you're putting individual black boxes on a blank canvas you have very few things that you have to put on that canvas for, before it starts working. Yeah, they've, but again, the quantum computers that they're talking about now do the same calculations. They just do them a lot faster, but they don't let you compute anything that you couldn't compute with um, this gadget eventually if you had enough tape and enough patience. It's just a simple table. If you have um, this symbol on the tape and this symbol inside, then you write symbol, move left or right, and put a new symbol into the box replacing the old one. And you, it just goes by that table. No real smarts in there. Just look up on the table. This row, this happens. It's, um, it's a very simple model. <laughs> and yeah, depending on, you can have different numbers of symbols that you can have on the tape and on the register inside. I think the one that they used for the Magic the Gathering Turing machine had um, three possible symbols on the tape, which were three colors, and had um, only two possible states in the box because cards were phased in and out of play. So you're either in or you're out. That's two possibilities. And I have the suspicion that if we have any, any more questions, then we have to take them to the pub. So I think I'll close the talk here. I I mean in this one you don't care about speed so 
so that doesn't make any difference. <laughs> but um, yeah, I in order to get better than um, Turing complete, you'd have to have a different kind of quantum computer than the one that they're developing now. So. Um, yep. In case of video cards, yep. Kind of stuff. Is that universal computing or is that just requirements of um, um, it's no, no physical type of computer? Like analog? No, it doesn't have any analog. It's all. I don't know if they are Turing complete, probably, but they're definitely not more than Turing complete. They just do it like 10 to 100 times faster than than on the main. CPU. It's actually, if you have a, a mathematical calculation that you want to do really fast, it's worthwhile sending it to the graphics unit and telling it, just calculate that, don't display it, give it back to me. Yeah, it's just, it's just a lot faster for some calculations. And, okay, last question. <laughs> really last. I think that one needs like a beer, maybe two. <laughs> but you could probably, you could make a Turing complete computer out of logs and buckets and um, and an infinite supply of buckets and water. Yeah. Okay. I think I better turn off turn off this because I think. Um, the